Hello, everybody. Um, I'm glad I was asked to speak this afternoon or the, today on, uh, on Male Caregiving Support Group. I'm a facilitator for the Alzheimer's Association Male Caregiver Support Group, and I'll kind of break that down for you. You know, why is it that we feel that males need their own support group? They can't be mixed with a, in a mixed community with, with males and females. My colleagues and I, 20 some odd years ago, took a look and it became very clear that, that men feel differently, men share differently, men are fixers. Men want to fix things. They don't uh, feel grief the same way as women do. On the other side, the women are primarily, in many cases, they are nurturers. I mean, after all, a guy never had a baby never had an umbilical cord attached to them, and they don't have the same relationship that, that uh, women do with their family. So that's what we decided. We brought them in to the male caregiving support group. Now, what drives them? Why do they come in to my support group, to our support group? We've got a couple here, and we've got several in St. Louis, where I'm from. They come, they're looking for a roadmap. They're looking for a way to know what's going to happen in the future. What is this disease about? What can I expect in the future? What's going to happen to my wife? In most cases, our caregivers are caring for their wives. There are a few that care for their moms or their sisters. And, and it, so you get that that's what the guys are, that's what a support, that's what uh, caregiving is, and a support group. What's a support group? A support group is a safe place. It's where people can come and say whatever they want to. They can express their emotions. They can cry. They can laugh. And they know that they won't be judged. And they know that whatever happens in that, in that support group room is going to stay in that support group room. We do not discuss their, their business outside that room. So it's a safe place to share. So let's get into what can they expect. First of all, they have to understand that this is a one-way road with Alzheimer's. It is a progressive disease that is in some, at some point in the future going to be part of what causes their loved one's death, unless there's some unusual circumstance that happens. What's, what can they see in the first part of the journey? We explained to them that they're going to see subtle changes. Changes that, things that all of us do, but, they, but the people with Alzheimer's disease do it differently. We all might lose track of our telephone. We all might lose track of our purse. But typically, we don't put our telephone in the freezer or the trash can. Somebody with Alzheimer's does that. It really happens. They're going to see someone who used to make chocolate chip cookies from scratch who can now not follow a recipe. They're going to see people that deal with a person who can maybe not do short words or do texts or do emails. That's in the early stages. They can expect this person to be in denial there is who among us wants to be told that they have Alzheimer's? So like many other diseases, the, the person with Alzheimer's is going to tell their loved one, no, nope, you're wrong, it's not me. That's not, uh, I can't get Alzheimer's. They can expect anger and suspicion from their loved one, from their wife. It's not unusual for the wife to go to the the husband and say, you know, I don't think you're going to this support group. I think you're going out with your girlfriend. Whether that's true or not doesn't matter because that's what this person thinks. And that takes me into what can they expect about dealing with the person logically? Nothing. The Alzheimer's brain does not allow logic. It just doesn't. I had a doctor tell me when I was caring for my mother many years ago that don't expect to win every argument. 
And it was true, except I didn't win any arguments. And it doesn't make, it doesn't make any difference whether you win or lose because you may have that same argument again tomorrow. When my fellows come into my support groups, they, they have two principal concerns over and over and over. The first is, why does my wife ask me the same question multiple times, 12, 13, 14, 20 times within a 10 minute period, I might get the same question. The answer is, you have to join that person's reality. You have to get inside how they're thinking. They're not thinking normally like you and I think. They are not speaking from the disease's point of view. The disease is driving them to say, I don't know you anymore. The disease is driving them to ask that same question and remember that that is the first time they've ever asked that question in their mind. Once you join their reality, that becomes what I refer to as the aha moment in my support groups. These guys look at me and say, my God, that's not the same person I used to deal with. The second thing they want to know is, why do they argue with me? Well, they argue with me because in their mind, their argument is the right arg argument. So those are some of the things they can expect early on in the Alzheimer's process. As the process grows, we tell them to set up a triage. What's really important to your relationship with this person? I had a lady come to me in a meeting one day, and not in a, not in a male support group meeting, obviously, but she was concerned because her husband liked to help her with dinner and cleaning up after dinner. And he would put the plates where the soup bowl should be and the forks where the knives should be. And I asked her, so what? You know, why is that important to you? What's important is when your husband walks out the door and is gone for two or three hours and he comes back with a stranger, maybe a police officer has found him, but maybe it's just a stranger in the neighborhood. That's important to secure him and make this and make, make this person safety make this person safe. So those are some of the things to expect. Now, as you get on with this disease, in late stages, and I, I talk about stages, but the stages are blurred. There's no bright line between early stage and middle stage and late stage. They kind of get muddled in there. But some of the things are more prevalent in the other stages, in the late stage. Shadowing, the person starts to, the person with dementia starts to follow the caregiver around the house and doesn't get away from them. That particular problem gets worse when sundowning takes effect. Sundowning is a situation where the person that's with dementia starts to behave differently after the sun goes down. That's why it's called sundowning. When it gets dark, the questions get more, the more numerous. The following gets more closer and happens more often. And the behavior changes. They're also at this point, you're going to, you, the, the caregiver can expect more intimate care. Now is the time when they have to be, the person has to be helped dressing, maybe brushing their teeth, maybe showering, maybe restroom, bathroom breaks. All these things that you wouldn't expect to have to help someone with and you've never had to do since you might have had a, a toddler around the house that you had to help with these things. And this again reinforces to the caregiver, to the guys in the sport group, that their situation has changed. They are no longer the caregiver husband, the husband of seven years, the husband partner of several decades. They are now a caregiver husband and their primary role is caregiving. And their partner that they knew is gone. 
This is what we refer to as ambiguous loss. Ambiguous loss means that you have a person that's here, but not really here. The, the woman that you shared your life with, that you bought houses with, that you made decisions with, that person, you can still see them, you can still talk with them, they sound the same, they look the same, but they're not the same. Some of the caregivers refer to this as the first death. This person is now gone. This person I love is now gone. You have now changed into someone who has to de deal with med management, who has to deal with doctors, who has to deal with resistance, who has to deal with misplacing things in odd places. All those things, in addition to the intimate things we've talked about, are now your responsibility to ensure they happen. So that's kind of where we're at with the, care, with, the, the, with the care receiver, with the person with dementia. But what about you? What about, what about the caregiver himself? What's happening with this person? This person has to be reminded to take care of himself. The same, in the same way you take care of yourself before you became a caregiver, you have to accentuate that now. If you've been good about your diet, can, you had to continue to be good about your diet. That can get tough because sometimes the patient, the person with Alzheimer's disease, we encourage them to eat several meals a day, s small meals, because they never know, they really truly do not know when they're hungry. You gotta remember that what Alzheimer's disease is, is the component parts of your brain not talking to you to each other. So when your person has just had dinner and they come to you a few minutes later and say, I'm hungry, that's because their brain hasn't told them that they've eaten recently. Conversely, if they come to you and say, I'm not hungry now, they don't know that they haven't eaten for several hours. So, <clears throat> These are the things that you have to, again, join their reality and try to figure out, be a good detective to figure out why they are like they are. Is their behavior being caused because of anger? Is their behavior being caused because they're tired, because the room's too cold, because the room's too hot? Is there maybe a UTI going on? Is there a headache going on? You just don't know unless you're being a good detective. Taking care of yourself also includes what we call a respite zone, if you may. That is a corner of your house where you go to and you might have your favorite easy chair and your favorite snack and your favorite drink, your tea or your coffee or your adult drink, if that's what it's all about, if that's what you like. A lot of people want to read their Bible here. or they got the music going? or they got candles going? So a respite zone can be very, very helpful. It's also time to take care of yourself because fully 20%, 18 to 20% of caregivers, male caregivers, predecease their wives. So what's gonna happen when you're not there anymore? Who's gonna care for that person? Have you set, have you set in place a way to take care of the person after they're gone? And what if it's not just after you're gone? What if it's not death? What if it's you're just down because you have a, a medical problem that puts you on your back for a couple of weeks? There's ways to do that. Who's gonna, have you talked to a lawyer? Have you got durable power of attorney in place? Do you have a trust? Do you need a trust? These things all are about taking care of yourself as well as taking care of your loved one. You get to a point now where you start asking, where can I go for help? And that's, that's what they're coming to the association for. It's what they're coming to the support group for. There are a lot of organizations that can help. In addition to your personal, your personal help, 
You've got your church if you're a person of faith. You've got your family. You've got your golf buddies if that's what you do. So you have people like that that can help, your personal people. You also have the Alzheimer's Association and whatever city you happen to be in. You've got Duke who has some terrific programs going on. You've got web pages on many, many sites, many, many organizations. You have Zoom meetings. You have support groups. You have education meetings. When I'm not doing my support group, then I'm doing community education. I can talk all day about the 10 warning signs and about communications and conversations, and, but that's not what I'm there to do in a support group. Reach out to us, to other organizations if you, have to, if you want to. Use the phone, call us. You know, we have an 800 phone number that's there 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. You know, help yourself. That's where you can get some help. So let's just go through, remember, you're on a journey, and your journey on day one is going to be different than your journey on day, year eight, possibly. Um, and as you go through that, you're in this support group not only to take information from other people, but you also become an information giver. You, have, you are going to learn things that the next person that walks in the door as a relative rookie doesn't know, and now you're going to share with them. That's the dynamics of a support group, and I love it. If I can just keep my mouth shut in the support group and let these guys tell, me, tell each other what's going on, they know so much more than I do. Yes, I cared for my mother, but she didn't live with me. She lived in her own home, and that's a whole different thing. I told a gentleman one time after his wife passed, I said, I know what you're going through. And he said, no, you don't. You don't have any clue what I'm going through. That was a big experience for me, and I don't. I don't know what these guys are going through. So identify where you're at in the, in the journey. Follow. Join their reality. Try to get inside their brain. Try to think like they can. What is causing this behavior? Seek help. You know, we're fixers, guys. I mean, gentlemen, are, guys tend to be fixers. We want to fix things. But you can't fix Alzheimer's disease. You can modify behavior. You can medicate for it. You can be patient with it, but you're not going to fix it. You're not going to fix it. Just a couple of final points here. It's okay to laugh. This is an awful disease, and you're going to cry more than you laugh. But when there's a time to laugh, laugh. I've got uh, a fellow I know who had a family dog, and he came down from the upstairs to the downstairs at one point, and he asked his wife, who had Alzheimer's, where is Fido? Because the front door was open and Fido's gone. And while you might have expected a lot of answers, I don't know where Fido is. I don't know who Fido is. I don't care where Fido is. I didn't know he had a dog. You might expect all those answers. But no, he says, where is Fido? And she looks at him and very seriously says, one. That was her answer. Now, folks, that's funny. That guy, he still laughs about that. That's years ago. That is a situation that is just, you just have to laugh at it. You just have to laugh at it. Finally, finally, moments of joy. In my mother's end stage, when I had to put her into a nursing home, she was in a place where they had a little garden outside, and we could go for a walk. And as we walked, we would hold hands. And because she was a gardener, she would see the roses in there, and she would see, she could tell me that's a Bob Hope rose, and that's an Abraham Lincoln rose, and that's a something else rose. I'm not a gardener. I don't know what they're called. But she knew it, and she would smell it, and she would get a smile on her face. And then we'd walk down the little walkway toward a bench, and she would sing songs. Some of them were World War II songs. Some of them were just funny little kid songs that she knew when she was a kid. But to see her smiling and laughing, not being able to call me by name, but she was having fun. She was enjoying herself. That, for me, is a moment of joy. You're going to have a lot of those. You're going to have a lot of those in your, 
in your journey. And I encourage you to think about those when your journey is over. We often get a lot of questions about Alzheimer's disease. And the primary question, which I ex I've explained many times, is explain dementia versus Alzheimer's. What's the difference in them? Dementia is a catch-all phrase for many brain-related illnesses. I, I, I think of it like cancer. There's not just cancer. There's skin cancer, there's breast cancer, there's heart cancer, I guess, kidney cancer. There's all types of cancer, and there's all types of dementias. Alzheimer's accounts for about 70% of all those dementias. And there's a long list of the rest of them uh, with frontal temporal dementia, alcohol, abuse dementia. dementia. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them. But that's one of the questions I get. What about driving? When should my person stop driving? If you're lucky enough, your person might come to you and say, you know what, I don't think I should be driving anymore. And would you take the keys and sell the car? Well, that's, if that happens to you, you're a, lucky, you're a lucky person. More often, there's some resistance to, nobody wants, all along this journey, you gotta remember the independence is going away and going away is going away. Taking the car away is one of those main independent factors that people don't want to give up. There's ways to get around that. Uh, you can disable the car. Sometimes they call a mechanic and they re-able the car. Um, you can park the car down the street and then they think the car's been stolen. There's lots of things that you can do. So what about driving? Now, if it really gets to be difficult, you can also go to your state uh, motor vehicle department and and have them tested, and they can be the big gorilla in the room, and they'll hand you a piece of paper that says you can't drive anymore. It's not me. It's the state of North Carolina. Um, why is my person's sleep pattern upside down? This is when it comes time to be a good detective. Um, there's a, there is one story about a lady who was up all night, and it turns out that she was a nurse at one time, and she was always on a night shift. So once the husband figured out what well, she's just going back in her mind to her days as a night shift nurse, it made all the sense in the world that she was up all night and sleeping during the day. Um, what are some of the other questions that, that people come to me with? I, I've talked a little bit about why are they hungry, why are they not hungry. What about medications? Is there any medication out there? This is a real hot topic today. There is a new one out there that looks like it's going to, for the first time, stem the tide of Alzheimer's. It's going to slow it down. It's actually going to slow it down, and that's a wonderful thing if it works, if it works. And if it doesn't, there are other medications out there that just modify behavior. They keep people from getting upset. They keep people from having hallucinations. Um, there are two or three different st types of medication, and, all you, and you've got the doctors out there that will tell you, which of those medications is right for you. What about Christmas parties? What about family get-togethers? Large groups of people tend to upset Alzheimer's patients. So if you're going to have a large party, first of all, try to have it in your house. Second of all, try to do it in small groups. They're, the person with Alzheimer's, depending on where they're at in their journey, is probably, possibly not going to know the people in the room. And all this noise and all this hubbub and opening gifts and candles and on and on, they might just have to retire to another room and take a breather from all that. 
Same thing with going to, you know, family reunions or going to baseball games. What about traveling? Particularly if you're a male traveling with a woman, it can be kind of difficult. I've experienced that. When your loved one goes into a ladies' room at an airport and doesn't come back out, well, you got to find some help. You find a local matron and you say, would you go in and see if, describe your lady and see if she's still there. So now I'm going to wrap it up. And now uh, I'm glad I, glad I had an opportunity. I, this is a passion for me. I love my support groups and I'm happy to have my men in. And I hope uh, if you're a man looking for a support group, I hope you look us up either in North Carolina or where else we might have them. Thank you all very much.